Right, good evening everyone. Um, my name's Annie Robinson. I'm the SIEM Scottish Project Officer. I've uh, recognised quite a few of the names that have popped up in the chat function. Um, I think there's a few people that are probably just finishing off work for the day, so will join us um, as, they, as they can. So I'll just do a wee introduction while we're waiting for people to join. So thank you everyone for joining us and for the speakers tonight um, in advance for their efforts. Um, we've got a few people that are new to SIEM, so I thought I'd do a little introduction. So SIEM's a professional body representing and supporting studying and practicing ecologists and environmental managers. There are over 6,000 members, of which we've got 655, I think, in Scotland. And SIEM members work for a wide range of employers in um, varied ecological and environmental management roles in local government, statutory organisations, NGOs, consultancy, science and research, and business and in industry and academia. And actually, it's this real mix of members that's probably that one of the real strengths of SAIM. And we're really fortunate in Scotland that we've got a very active um, geographic section and a, a full committee made up of volunteer members that organise lots of talks like tonight, field trips um, when we can and social events every year. We also organise the annual Scotland Conference, which this year will be on greening our grey, improving the biodiversity in urban landscapes. And that will be on the 5th and the 7th of October. And the call for papers for that will be launched at the beginning of next week. So do look out for that. We will keep microphones muted so that we don't get any background noise. Um, if you've got any questions as the presentations proceed, please pop them in the chat facility. If anyone has any problems with that, do message me and I'll help you through it. We'll pose a few questions at the end of each presentation and then at the end of all the presentations, we'll have a further question and discussion session. So I'm now going to hand over to Tony Marshall from the SIEM Scotland Committee, who works at ACOM, who will introduce the speakers and Tony is also going to be facilitating all the questions. Thanks, Annie. Uh, yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for joining. Uh, it's great to see so many here and especially uh, from outside Scotland as well. I think that's one of the benefits of doing these things virtually is that uh, they become far more accessible. So, yes, thank you very much for joining. Um, my name uh, is Tony Marshall. Uh, as Annie says, I've, uh, I'm a member of the Scottish Section CIM Committee. I also lead ACOM's ecology team in Scotland and Ireland. Uh, and I'm based in the Edinburgh office. Um, I'll just, uh, I've got a very easy job this afternoon. I'm really just introducing people and um, moderating questions, but I'll just briefly um, give you an idea of what the uh, presentations are this afternoon. So we'll start with um, Chris White. Chris is an associate director at ACOM based in uh, London. Um, he's going to uh, give us an overview of the Natural Capital Laboratory and the work that uh, has been going on there. Uh, by various organisations. Um, after that, we've got um, a substitute, super substitute uh, speaker. Michael is going to um, talk about uh, natural capital, uh, digital natural capital accounting. Um, that'll be followed by Pete Cowley, who um, leads ACOM's aquatic ecology team, and Benji Barsa, who wins for the sunniest location, uh, phoning in from for this. Um, uh, Benji works for Nature Metrics, and uh, those guys have been doing uh, eDNA work in the aquatic environment at the Natural Capital Laboratory. And then finally, we have Max Heaver from DEFRA, uh, and he's going to talk about uh, rewilding and species introductions. So uh, I think without further ado, if I could introduce Chris White, uh, and he's going to tell us about the Natural Capital Laboratory. Hi, guys. Uh, can you hear me all right? Great. Okay, uh, go on to the next slide, please. Brilliant. Uh, so this is a hopefully fairly quick overview of the Natural Capital Laboratory. Um, there's quite a lot of stuff going on in the project. Um, and the team here today are some of the specialists who are leading some of the technical disciplines and other different bits of work that are going on. So we'll uh, are more than able to go into some of the details. So this presentation is going to be just a sort of high level picture of what's going on. Um, if you have got any questions, please do raise them in the chat and we can um, go into any of the particular aspects in more detail later on. But yeah, the Natural Capital Laboratory, it's a um, joint venture between a number of different organisations. Um, so on the one hand, we have the landowners, Roger and Amelia Lease, 
who own this beautiful piece of land up in the Highlands of Scotland. Uh, then we have a team from University of Cumbria who are providing the research, academic uh, excellence and conservation science. Um, and I think we've got Ian Cumbria on the call today, who's a uh, uh, professor at University of Cumbria and leading the IUCN task force on um, rewilding, providing that expertise to the project. Uh, then we also have the Lifescape Project, which is a rewilding conservation charity. Um, Adam Eagle couldn't make it today, but he's the CEO of that. He's been leading um, from that side of things, pushing forward the site management and rewilding side of the project. And then we've got ACOM, who are leading on sort of general technical support across a range of different disciplines. So there's a number of different people together. And if you go to the next slide, please. Um, this will hopefully give a bit of an overview of what uh, we're doing on the project. Uh, so to start with the Natural Capital Laboratory, it's based on a site up in the Highlands of Scotland. It's about uh, an hour from Inverness and about sort of 45 minutes from Loch Ness. Um, it's a pretty remote and rural and beautiful area of the Highlands. And next slide, please. And um, there's broadly sort of four aims to what we're doing for the Natural Capital Laboratory. So on the one hand, um, it's a rewilding project. And the idea is to look at this piece of land up in the Highlands and look at how it can be rewilded, uh, how we can restore ecosystem functioning, bring species back to play, um, the roles that are needed in, to allow the ecosystem to function uh, naturally, and also look at bringing people and the community together to sort of interact with the environment uh, and um, look at nature and landscape in a new way. And um, so part of the project is looking at how we can adopt the ICN's principles and rewilding in a very practical case study and look at what it means on the ground to implement rewilding. And um, next slide, please. Uh, so that's the rewilding piece of work. Um, one of the things that's sort of kind of unique about the laboratory side of this project is that uh, alongside the rewilding project, uh, what we'd like to do is basically set up uh, a number of different teams who are looking at various aspects of what's happening in the rewilding process and monitoring the change and evaluating the outputs. Um, and the sort of three core parts of the laboratory. The first one's around data collection. So um, here we're interested in using new and emerging technologies to try and collect as much information and data as possible about what's happening on site as it changes. So uh, flying drones over the site, using camera traps, thermal imaging cameras, AI programs, heart rate monitors, robotic rovers, looking at these technologies and applying them to the site to see how we can gather data and particularly how we can make data acquisition and processing cheaper, faster, more rep replicable, more transparent um, and compared to sort of the more traditional approaches that we use. Uh, then once we've got that data, another sort of key strand of the laboratory is trying to pull together the information and look at how we can measure change each year and particularly look at how we can um, understand the values in terms of social impacts, environmental impacts, and economic impacts. So we're looking at using natural capital and social capital accounting, um, and then looking at broader six capital accounting approaches, and basically trying to go up the framework where we can measure the costs and the benefits of this sort of rewilding process each year as the site changes over time. And hopefully, uh, this will pull together a really clear sort of database and understanding of what rewilding can look like and what the costs and benefits are and how they sort of spread out across different parts of society. And then the sort of final strand of the laboratory is to look at this idea of communication. And one thing we typically do uh, is produce technical reports and spreadsheets that nobody likes to read. Uh, so for this project, we're particularly interested in how we can make more interesting and more engaging outputs how can we take this data and these, this information and make it more accessible through things like virtual reality, digital platforms, 3D models, um, and more interactive ways of communication. Uh, if you go on to the next slide, please. So that's the laboratory. It's uh, uh, about two years in, and if we like, play here, we should have a short video of broadband learning. Um, there's no sound on it, but there should be some pictures coming. Yes, that's fantastic. So hopefully this will make it a little bit more uh, tangible to people because it can be uh, you know, quite difficult to get your head around this sort of project. 
Um, you can see here, this is the land, that's the um, house on site, which is used as a sort of research base for people doing um, work on the site. Uh, you can see here, there's quite a stark divide between on the one hand, some of the sort of dense kind of plantation woodland, and some of the more open clear fell areas. Um, you can also see on the right hand side, there is a river running along the site. Uh, and there's a sort of path running through the middle, which uh, has been through this area of clear fell. Uh, and then a bit of natural regeneration, some planting on the one hand side. Um, so I think the boy one's struggling a little bit on my side at least. But here is this is the sort of 3D model that's been generated from the drone footage taken on site, and this helped to be used as a sort of spatial planning tool uh, to understand what's happening on site and how it's changing over time. So that's a quick overview of what the site is and what it looks like. Um, to try and break down some of the work streams that have been going on in the first year of the project, which kicked up around uh, April 2019, I think it was. So the first thing we did was do a lot of uh, baseline surveys to try and understand what habitats were on site, what was going on, uh, the species diversity and what things looked like before any of the sort of rewilding process started. Um, then we took this information and put it together to develop a baseline natural capital account. Um, and to try and make that sort of more interesting than a typical spreadsheet, we developed a digital capital accounting software, which um, Michael's going to look at in uh, a couple of minutes to give you a sort of demo of what it looks like. But the idea of this account is to sort of give an overview of the baseline conditions of the natural capital assets on the site, uh, the flows of ecosystem services, and the values that are being generated um, to society. Then another area of research is looking into virtual reality in year one. We're very conscious of this idea that um, you know, rewilding and recreating the woodland is probably going to take a hundred or a couple of hundred years before you actually see significant change in terms of uh, forest cover. Um, so what we were interested in doing is whether we could use virtual reality, sorry, yeah, uh, using virtual reality to allow stakeholders to come to site and look at different ecological features uh, and understand how the decisions we make today could lead to very different landscapes in the future and use that as a way of engaging people with the discussion about how the land should be managed. Um, we've also been looking at remote sensing as a technique to uh, more quickly, cheaply um, and replicably collect data on habitat extent and condition, and whether we can use that to undertake uh, monitoring of habitat change remotely. And we've been looking into the idea of drone surveys and how we can collect information using UAVs uh, and setting up sort of regular seasonal fly throughs across the site so we can have um, a set path of, of data collection from the drones that sort of fly along this automated route uh, at various points in the year. And then a final area of research looking at was around this idea of social capital accounting. And I think it's a big um, aspect of sort of rewilding and these ecosystem restoration projects about uh, social issues and communities and trust and engagement and bringing people along as part of the project rather than just focusing on trees and carbon and biodiversity. So we were really interested to see if we could set up a framework where we could start measuring social capital assets like relationships with local groups and the flows of services that um, are provided over time. So that's really at the heart of how we're measuring the impacts of this kind of process. Yep, that was year one. We go on to what I think is my final slide, talk about uh, what we've been doing this year on the site. So we had a little bit of a COVID-related hiatus for about six months, um, but things are pretty much up and running again. We're allowed to go back to site, which is very exciting for a lot of us to be at home for a long time. Um, and the sort of the, the themes or work packages that um, different teams are working on this year are around first understanding this sort of uh, the aquatic ecology environment um, and what's going on in the river system on site, and whether we can use techniques like environmental DNA analysis to understand change over time and look at how that compares to traditional approaches. We're also looking at um, the costs and the benefits of nature based solutions for meeting carbon targets. So, specifically, looking at what are the costs and benefits of peatland restoration compared to a woodland planting, compared to solar panels as a means of meeting um, carbon targets. And we've been also looking at how we can more cheaply and uh, replicably collect data on species populations and monitor change in species over time. So we've been looking at developing a standardized remote 
camera trap and audio moth survey, um, which collects data on the site and allows us to sort of monitor uh, species change more easily. Um, we've been doing a piece of work looking into the potential for reintroducing species, so looking at species that have been lost to the landscape, the functional roles that they play in you know, the ecosystems that are there, um, which may be suitable for being brought back into the site and the wider region. Uh, then also we've been looking at um, peatland carbon, so looking at installing um, uh, measurements on site so we can understand how much carbon's in there, what condition the peatland's in, how that can be managed to improve that over time. And then finally collecting all the information we have on the site and using that to update the, the natural capital accounts and start to measure how things are changing and start um, understanding uh, change over time. So that's a quick overview of all the stuff that's going on in the lab. Um, it's a yeah, it's a four-way collaboration between the landowners, the uh, University of Cumbria, Lyskit Project, and ACOM. And the ACOM website on the Natural Capital Lab has got all the reports and information from year one uh, and should be updated uh, in a couple of months' time with the results and the findings from year two. Yeah, I think that's all of my slides. I want to take a couple of quick questions before we move on. Great, thank you, Chris. Um, we had one question from Ro during the presentation. Um, how are we using heart rate monitors and what for? So um, this is something we did earlier on in the first year of the project. There's a lot of interest in the idea of being outside uh, and engaging this kind of thing in the natural environment, working outside and volunteering as uh, being good for well-being. So we wanted to see if we could gather any quantitative data on that. So we basically, all the volunteers that went to site were given uh, a number of qualitative questionnaires every sort of couple of hours to see how they're feeling in terms of anxiety, um, self-work, happiness, um, uh, mental well-being questions. And then also we took readings of heart rate, pulse, blood pressure, et cetera, to try and get some of the quantitative physiological uh, readings on site. Um, we did this while they were outside on the um, MCL site, but also while they were back in the office before and afterwards to see if there was any sort of measurable change. Um, and although it was a very small sample size, there was a clear sort of marked difference in people's subjective well-being, but also the um, uh, the physiological signs of lower uh, blood pressure and lower heart rates um, while they're outside. So uh, it was very much a sort of exploratory test. But one thing we're like, one thing we're interested in pushing further over the next year and next couple of years is looking at how we can adopt these, some of these measures to better put a handle on and quantitative numbers of understanding things like social capital, well being, engagement, trust, and trying to pin down some of these more difficult to um, measure social, social attributes. Thank you. I'll, I'll just do one more and um, keep a hold of the others, um, just conscious of time. Uh, Robert Potter's asked if there was a reason why this particular site has been chosen. Um, so, well, basically, it, it's come from the landowners, Roger and Amelia Lee, who had a sort of exciting vision for the site to rewild it. Um, and then during one of the Lyskit Project board meetings, which I'm a member, and Roger Lee, I think from this call, was also a member, we we're talking about this uh, rewilding project they had in mind for the site. Uh, and basically, as we got talking, we started talking about some of ACOM's work around natural capital accounting and how it'd be really interesting to apply that to the site and get a sort of, you know, a good database of what's happening as the rewilding process starts. Uh, and then, yeah, we just got a bit carried away and started adding more ideas on top of the others. And um, Ian at University of Cumbria had some ideas and um, it, it's basically sort of grown from that point. Uh, we're now also reaching a point where there's definitely a limit to what you can do on one piece of land, uh, which has got a very sort of specific context. Uh, and we have this sort of longer term vision of the natural capital laboratory being a set of connected sites. Um, so around the country uh, and then outside the UK. So we ideally would like to see laboratories around the world with teams working on ecosystem restoration projects. Uh, applying sort of similar and new techniques and then sharing the learning and the output so that we can, you know, come up with new approaches and new tools and new ways of looking at the land and how we can use it to help tackle uh, climate and biodiversity crisis. 
Perfect. Thank you. There's one actually question from Lucy uh, that might be quite quick to answer. Is the capital accounting, social capital accounting work available online? Yep. So everything we did in year one is available on the website. Uh, there's a sort of digital accounting platform. And then in the main report, there's some stuff on the social capital and a full, uh, if you go to the end, there's an appendix with all the numbers in, if you're into that kind of thing. Uh, and we should have the next set of accounts, I think, in September, which will be a kind of, again, more detailed updated version with um, hopefully some data from two years' time. Great. Okay, thanks, Chris. Um, so the next speaker is Michael Aquilina, who's going to talk about uh, digital natural capital accounting. Uh, Michael, take it away. Hi, everyone. Um, lovely to be here. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Uh, my name is Michael Aquilina. I'm an um, environmental consultant in the ACOMS Natural Capital Environment and Game team, uh, and I'm here to talk about the progress and the next steps in terms of digital natural capital accounting. Um, so if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, so the purpose of any natural capital accounts is to clearly demonstrate where natural assets um, are delivering ecosystem services, first by identifying, identifying the service provided, and then by quantifying the level of benefits provided and uh, where um, possible, uh, an indicative uh, monetary flow of that benefit. Um, so the example on your uh, screen here, this flow chart shows that the natural um, assets here, the woodland habitat um, made up of trees as, as individual assets, but also as an, as an ecosystem provide um, benefits in terms of water storage and infiltration. Um, and that helps in terms of regulating um, water flows so this has a, a societal benefit in terms of reducing um, flood risk uh, in, uh, and um, providing increased storage during those sort of events. And you can uh, take an indicative uh, value, monetary value from that um, due to the, the reduced cost because of the re reduced damage um, from those services. Next slide, please. Um, so currently natural capital accounting is undertaken and, and presented in an Excel format. So those screenshots there are a typical natural capital account that we, we would do here at ACOM. Um, and the tools can be quite um, number heavy and, and, and slightly intimidating from a non-technical um, standpoint. Um, and, and the values are all quite static. So they're based on data, the data at the time um, of developing the account, uh, meaning that any updates from monitoring, for example, uh, have to be undertaken manually. So this can, this can end up being quite a complicated uh, and uh, lengthy task. Uh, so um, for the majority as well of the data that you have, it's, it's based on uh, literature-based values. Uh, and so the digital natural capital account is trying to uh, look at ways of replacing that with localized um, data to, to that site. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah, so the, the um, digital natural capital account is, is, is the first of its kind. It's, it's web-based and we hope that it will act as a, a powerful monitoring and, and engagement tool, uh, particularly for a non-technical audience by, by summarizing the account information in an interactive um, and accessible format. So we've been, we've been developing the, the account uh, part of the first year of the NCO and, and through to the second year. Um, and it's, it's pushing the boundaries in terms of innovation uh, and we're starting to explore remote sensing and machine learning technologies uh, to provide real-time updates uh, from the site um, and update the account from that. And um, a, key, a key part of that development is now working towards um, um, automatically updating the account through, through some of the, through, through using remote sensing and, and machine learning. Um, so this is a short video taking you through the, uh, what's the, what the website looks like. So um, it can be accessed through your, through your internet browser uh, and it's set out in, a, in, in, um, in the structure here. If you could just press play and I can run through it. Is that going to go? Yeah. So on the left hand side there, you've got a, a navigation bar to take you through the, the website. And then on, on the top, um, these buttons at the top there can take you through each section of the page and as you can see um, there's a number of engaging formats there including videos and photos and um, what's most impressive is, is this 3D and, and 2D mapping layers um, and you can interact with that mapping layer and click on, on the layers there so here we're going to see uh, user click on 
um, species monitoring and some information on, on the habitat data. Um, and this interactive element should really encourage users to explore the information being presented um, and by having a, a split screen with, with that map on one side and, um, and the information on the other side, it should, it should just be a good educational and communication tool. Um, other things that we're using is um, Google Street like functions where you can where you can click on on, on uh, areas of the site and get and get a view um, from from the drone. So um, some really exciting developments there. Next slide, please. Uh, great. So um, there's going to be two things here that come up: so the, the physical flow account and the uh, monetary flow account. So these these demonstrate the, the, the reporting statements. Uh, on the website, um, and usually these are quite um, Excel number heavy um, tabs. Um, so it just shows just shows a way we're able to, to, to present our information, and and that that map on the right hand side uh, presents uh, changes in, in the monetary and physical flows uh, over time. So it's an interactive map. Uh, so Chris has touched on this. Uh, one of the examples of innovation, of innovation being tested uh, is using drones to do um, seasonal uh, fly-throughs. Um, so we started programming seven flight paths along the site, and drones will um, collect uh, high-resolution habitat data um, based um, on those on those flight paths, and they'll do that season after season. Um, and this will give us a visual record um, of how the site changes over time. Um, so our next steps moving forward into year two, we're going to kind of continue the development um, of those flight paths and that, that habitat uh, data collection. Um, but we're also exploring the use of multi-spectral um, cameras, um, which provide more information about what's going on on the ground. So this, this on the bottom left-hand side, that shows you kind of the generic kind of aerial footage that you would get. And then uh, the image dominated by red on that, on, on that, in that right square there. Um, shows you the extra information that these, these type of cameras can provide. So they can provide information about soil condition and moisture content. So it really enriches the data that we can collect on the site. Um, secondly, we're also looking at RTK accurate positioning. So it's a technology that um, will automatically position your aerial footage so that it's aligned perfectly uh, with the site and perfectly with the, the, the flight paths that the drones are taking each time. So the data that we're receiving is um, accurate exactly the same as it was um, for the last uh, monitoring phase. Uh, and finally, um, uh, another really exciting thing we're looking at is using modelling to test uh, scenarios, um, land use, uh, land management scenarios. So this is a, a digital twin, a digi basically a digital mock-up of the site. And what we can do is uh, essentially manipulate the layers um, in this 3D model and, and Look at the change uh, in a series of indicators that that, that change in habitat is, is providing. So, for instance, you could you could remove the layer of woodland and start to understand um, what sort of impacts that has on, on water flow and water quality. Thanks. Thanks, Michael. Um... Not sure if anyone has any questions at the moment, but if you do, just um, put them in the chat box and we can we can get them at the end. If none for now, then we'll just move on to um, the Aquatic Ecology and eDNA uh, presentation, which is going to be given by Pete Cowley from ACOM and Benji Barsa from Nature Metrics. Thank you, Tony. Um, hopefully you can all, all hear me okay. Um, yeah, so just following on from what uh, Chris and Michael have spoken about already, just our, our baseline assessment and monitoring on the Natural Capital Laboratory so far. So we're undertaking uh, an aquatic ecology baseline assessment through conventional monitoring, but also through some fairly innovative uh, eDNA studies, which Benji, Benji will talk about shortly. So yeah, you see a picture of the River Fecklin on site there. So runs adjacent to the site boundary. Uh, the catchment runs down into Loch Ness. So you might think it's a reasonably unspoilt uh, catchment, but there are effects, there are always impacts, land management impacts, impacts to impoundment due to hydropower schemes, 
etc so there's effectively there's always room for improvement as we know with the habitats so yeah a picture on the bottom right there my lucky colleague sampling last autumn on one of the smaller tributaries of the, the river fecklin so it's not just the river itself the the river sits in a catchment and it's dependent on peatland habitats upland habitats um tributaries locks and and all the terrestrial habitats in the catchment as well so it's uh, it's all, how all of those habitats operate holistically and how we can improve all of them. Um, next slide, please. So yeah, a couple of busy slides. I'm afraid I won't uh, read through all of this, but basically we've done, uh, we're on the second year of our study. So year one was a, a, a desktop study. So we looked at WFD uh, data, um, data from SEPA uh, in relation to the water body. Um, Year two this year, when we're into our suite of aquatic ecology um, field surveys and eDNA surveys. So Benji and Naturometrics are undertaking basically three different types of uh, eDNA survey, which we'll talk about shortly. So not just looking at aquatic species, but also looking at wider vertebrate DNA, as well as aquatic invertebrates and, and fish. So obviously this feeds into a wider hydrological and water quality assessment. Um, You'll know that through assessment of aquatic invertebrates, for example, we can infer a lot about water quality, habitat quality, and potential impacts on those on those water courses. So it's a very very thorough, very interesting study. Um, the outputs of those studies in the yellow boxes. So we're looking at, like I said, biological water quality, WFD status, um, CCI is the Community Conservation Index. Which, so the the community of invertebrates presence, uh, present tells us how significant they are in terms of conservation status and how rare those species are. We're not just looking at invertebrates, we're looking at uh, diatoms, aquatic macrophytes and fish as well. Uh, we're also carrying out river habitat surveys as well as the more five surveys for river condition assessment, uh, feeding into biodiversity net gain assessment. Uh, we've undertaken assessments for fish and freshwater pearl mussel through conventional and DNA surveys. So the overall aims, obviously, of the, the project is for rewilding. So how does rewilding of the site itself and, and forests, for example, how does that fit into enhancements of watercourses and the wider river catchment? So we're, we're thinking about effects such as uh, runoff, siltation, Will rewilding the terrestrial habitats have positive benefits on, on water quality, for example? Uh, can we look at planting riparian vegetation? So we're encouraging native species to grow rather than plantation conifer woodland. And will those native plant species, whether they're riparian or, or terrestrial, will, will they encourage uh, native aquatic species to move back into the, into the site and into the catchment? A lot of those aquatic species have terrestrial life stages. They may have aquatic larvae. They may be dependent on riparian plant species. So all of these impacts and benefits are, are intertwined effectively. And then how do we go to go on to measure those and monitor those changes and, and benefits through, through WFD status, through biodiversity net gain assessment, for example. Um, something that also developed as an aim was developing eDNA technologies and then how those can complement conventional monitoring to give us a better picture of, of habitats and species. So that's a really interesting aspect of this, uh, this study. Next slide, please. So just a quick summary of the, the species and some of the headlines that we've come up with so far. So the aquatic baseline studies we've We've established this is a, a fairly unspoilt catchment. There are impacts like I've just spoken about. So impacts to uh, hydromorphology through impoundments and, and dams, for example, for hydropower schemes. Um, we've still got a reasonably up, uh, unspoilt upland watercourse and, and tributaries. So a wide range of mayfly species, stoneflies, caddisflies, as well as true fly taxa. Species like uh, Betis atlanticus, which is it's unclear still whether it's a subspecies of, of other Betis mayfly species, 
but uh, there's opportunities there for further DNA work in particular, which uh, Benji will talk about later in relation to the, the char species. So just upstream of the site is Loch Killin, which is a reasonably small upland loch. Um, it's, it's famous, although probably not widely known for a, a subspecies of Arctic char called the Hadi char, which is actually named after Loch Killin, it's Salvolinus killinensis. So we, we've potentially detected that, that subspecies through eDNA sampling. And again, there's further work uh, in the pipeline potentially to explore that a bit further. We're potentially looking at getting tissue samples from that, uh, that fish to see if we can identify whether it is a, a subspecies or whether it's just another, another population of Arctic char. So really, really interesting study. Uh, we've identified six species of fish through eDNA, so lamprey, char, brown trout, European eel, amongst others. So some significant notable species there. Um, eDNA results, so we've, we've managed to prove that unfortunately freshwater pearl mussels are absent from, from the catchment, it appears. We've shown that water vole are present through using a vertebrate um, analysis for DNA. We've also picked up DNA of golden eagle, ptarmigan, dipper, water shrew, mountain hare, and numerous other species. So it's it's incredible just what you can what you can pick up through through DNA analysis. Next slide, please. So again, a busy slide, but just a brief overview of the the surveys we've undertaken. So conventional aquatic macroinvertebrate uh, surveys, a standard three minute kick sample looking for various uh, WFD indices, water quality indices, but also looking for invasive non-native species and whether they're having an impact on, on the site or in the wider catchment. Uh, diatom surveys, so diatoms are microalgae that live on stones and uh, woody debris in the, in the benthic layers of the watercourse. They also tell us about water quality um, in relation to WFD uh, compliance. Same with macrophyte surveys. Again, macrophytes are aquatic plants that live in the watercourses. So we're looking for native uh, bryophyte moss species and other, other aquatic macrophytes, as well as invasive non-native species. Um, the RHS and morph surveys pick up on the hydromorphological character of the watercourses. Now we can benchmark those and look to monitor enhancements in the future. Again, fish habitat, is there suitable fish spawning habitat in or around the site? Uh, and of course the eDNA analysis, so three methods for eDNA, metabar coding for fish. We've got bulk tissue analysis of invertebrate specimens. So the specimens we've analysed in the lab are then sent to the, anal uh, to the lab uh, for analysis by Nature Metrics. Um, and then we've also got water quality analysis for, sorry, water sample analysis for aquatic macroinvertebrates as well, which is a reasonably new, new technology that Nature Metrics are, are helping to develop. Next slide, please. So yeah, just a quick overview of the site and our sampling locations. So our first sample location was up, upstream in Loch Killin, uh, for eDNA, various samples down through the site, all the way down to just upstream of Loch Ness. So we've got a, a big natural barrier at the downstream end of Loch Killin. So unfortunately, we don't have those high profile migratory species like uh, Atlantic salmon. So we're fortunate to have European eel and brown trout and the Arctic char up near the site. So next slide, please. This just shows a quick comparison of the conventional monitoring with the eDNA results. So uh, four, four charts here, taxon richness shows us the total number of taxa recorded. So you see that the, the orange and blue lines show the comparison of conventional macroinvertebrate sample with the bulk um, eDNA analysis. So they're remarkably similar because they're looking at the same specimens effectively. The interesting one is the water quality DNA. So the gray line shows effectively a cumulative um, assemblage of species as you go down the catchment. There's a slight dip in the middle for, for what it, whatever reason we need to look into, but generally the species increases as you go downstream because we're picking up all of the, the species from upstream as well. Uh, just to look at one more of these, and that's the CCI comparison in the bottom right. So 
CCI is a notable species and how those species score in terms of uh, rarity or how notable they are. So again, the water sample eDNA is picking up a much wider range of species. So that's why it results in a much higher CCI score. So if you are purely um, assessing a site for CCI um, importance and the, the notable nature of species present, then it would make sense to do that eDNA water analysis. Uh, next slide, please. So this is just a few of the species that we've we've found. So top left is the large dark olive mayfly, and that's of course an adult. So the larvae spend a year or so in the water before emerging for a few days to breed as adults. Um, top right is a, uh, let me get this right, so that's the Amelitus inopinatus, which is another mayfly, but it's one that I've certainly never come across before in England. So it's really nice to see those species that are limited to upland Scotland. Same with the bottom right, which is Capnia atra, which is a stonefly, which again, I've never seen before in, in England. So we're looking at species that are very reliant on these upland conditions and indicative of very good water quality and good habitat conditions. Of course, there's always room to identify missing species that we can, we can look to bring in through, through habitat improvements. Next slide, please. So yeah, now over to Benji for the uh, eDNA. Thanks, Pete, and uh, yeah, great to be here. Um, we have a few quick slides. I didn't know how much sort of people knew, so I was just going to do a very rapid intro to the type of work um, that we are doing. You probably know us for a lot of the sort of great crested newt work, which is with a different type of kit. But what we're doing most of the time now in a lot of projects, both in the UK and globally, hence my, my current location, is the work on metabarcoding, especially from water samples, but also as Pete mentioned, we do work with bulk microinvertebrates. And more recently, we've started working more with soils and sediments, especially in the UK. So there's lots of exciting work happening. Um, and we can do this by sort of being able to use the sort of environmental medium as a, um, as a tool for us to be able to track and, and detect a whole variety of species and taxonomic groups that we can target with specific primers, which are, um, which are sort of uh, key sections of the DNA of certain taxonomic groups that allow us to sort of target a certain groups and not others. And I'll show you some of the the results from the data here at the NCL. So if you can just go to next um, and again twice. Uh, no, back, sorry. Um, so all the animals uh, shed uh, cells that contain DNA. It's not just cells, it can be sort of any form of secretion um, that ends up in the water and the water acts as a genetic soup and we can use the kits that you can see in the top right which have a small filter that you can uh, filter water through and the preservative that can be used so you don't need to refrigerate and send back to us for analysis. Uh, this water will contain a lot of genetic traces from, uh, from the wildlife and this remains detectable for a few days. And this is something that sort of Pete mentioned rapidly and we'll see in the data how this can mean that you will, that you will have some downflow of data with, with, within your sort of catchment. So that's something that is really important. And that's why it's, it's really key to sort of work with ecologists and experts on the site. Um, our vision is still for anyone to collect these high, uh, these high quality samples anywhere in the world. But at the same time, it's really important for these types of projects to work with people that really know these environments that can really interpret the data that can help to decide on the sampling strategy for these sites. So there's, there's, there's different approaches, of course, that sort of can be had. And this is something that we're always happy to discuss depending on the project. But it also means that you can work with citizen scientists, with people from local communities, local fishermen, that can help you and others collect data um, while they're out in, uh, in, in key sites. And that will sort of help you to involve them more in the wider sort of projects that everyone is involved in. Uh, next. So this is very rapidly what happens in the lab. So once the filter comes back to us, it 
in this case, it's, it's for the water analysis. It, uh, the, the DNA gets extracted from the filter. We then amplify the DNA of target groups. So this is what uh, Pete mentions. We, we work from the same sample. We're able to target multiple taxonomic groups. And this is a, a great way to really capture a lot of opportunistic and complementary data for your survey site. So for example, here, our key interest, as Pete said, was the freshwater environment, fish, the freshwater pearl mussel, but we decided to trial some of the, our vertebrate primers, which tend to capture sort of a much wider variety, much wider taxonomic variety from uh, your mammals to your amphibians and birds, occasionally reptiles, which are more rare. Um, and this is really a way to sort of get some nice data sets for your sites that you made, that you might not have time to sort of survey in a, in a traditional manner with camera traps and uh, sort of transects and point counts, et cetera. Um, so once the, once the DNA is amplified, it gets sequenced on a high throughput platform, uh, which, uh, which sort of generates uh, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of uh, sequences. And these then get matched against the reference taxonomic library. Uh, this is very well sort of uh, structured and complete for countries like the UK, especially for vertebrates, a bit less so for, uh, for invertebrates, but it's rapidly growing. And as we can see from our data with the team, which hopefully we'll be able to share at some point, there is a lot of, um, of species that are sort of uh, have been detected to species level. If you go to more diverse environments like here in West Africa or Latin America, Southeast Asia, you'll start seeing much bigger gaps. You might be able to get data to genus or order or family level, um, and you might have to work sort of on a more of a taxonomic free uh, manner, but it's always possible and you're always able to have replicable data and go back to that data in the future once the reference databases have been improved and uh, fill those gaps uh, sort of in the future. Next slide, please. And one more. Yeah, great. Um, so a total of six fish, 26 vertebrates, and 130, 136 macroinvertebrate taxa were detected just from the water samples collected. Uh, this first image here is from the fish-specific assay. You'll see that there's some non-fish species, which are just sort of opportunistic de detections that might have been amplified by the by our fish survey but by focusing on fish we are able to really um, uh, generate more detections for these particular taxonomic groups and i'll show you uh, what happens when you sort of amplify for a larger taxonomic groups and you might sort of miss some species the samples here are going from one to six, and this is from uh, one downstream, um, no, one upstream, sorry, to six downstream. So you, you can see, for example, here, as Pete mentioned, char is in very uh, small, um, small numbers compared to, for example, trout at the first site, which was sampled close to the lake. Uh, and these were all these were the only three species detected. As we start going downstream, we start to increase our detections from site four, we start getting the European eel, which probably is able to go up to a certain extent and then gets blocked, and down to site six, which is, as Pete said, close to the lake, where we were also able to uh, detect lamprey. Um, so you'll see that uh, we can get downstream flow of data. So char, which is obviously a sort of lake restricted species not found in the river, the DNA is trickling down and, and you can see the, the point is slowly getting smaller. So the relative abundance is decreasing within that sample. But this is something to take into account, obviously, if you're doing a survey in a fast flowing river. Um, but the great thing is that the downstream, um, the the DNA from downstream can't go upstream. So obviously, if you're picking up an eel uh, at uh, site six, five, and four, then you know that where your barriers are and where that species is not able to, say, migrate further upstream. So this is quite interesting for people that are looking at fish migration and barriers. It's also important to consider that for some species, uh, few for fish, we are not able to distinguish between very similar uh, genetic 
species. And for example, for the lamprey, we can't distinguish between the river and the brook, unfortunately, because they're so similar genetically that we can't tell the difference using the specific assay. Next. Okay, very quick example. This is the same again with your relative abundance, the size of the of the bubble plot indicating the number of the percentage number of sequence reads of that of that species within that sample, which can give you a good idea of relative abundance. So you can see here, for example, sort of higher lake species that are sort of from the mammals that are, are found further upstream, like red deer and uh, the, the ptarmigan, for example. You can see the sort of the um, there's more DNA found in the upstream sites compared to downstream. And as Pete pointed out, some pretty interesting species that were picked up, like the golden eagle, um, the water shrew, and others in small quantities. But these, again, were opportunistic uh, de detections that will allow us to sort of include further studies as part of the NCL and increase the species list and sort of have a better idea of how to structure our surveys in the future. So really useful. Um, next, please. So a brief mention for the Hattie char, um, sort of Pete went into a bit of detail, but I thought it'd be interesting just to sort of use it as a, as a small case study. So the sequence here was close, but an imperfect match to Arctic char. So 98.4% similarity, which is, we usually use a threshold of 98, but 99% is best. So we can see here that it's not an exact match to your sort of, your, um, your uh, type specimen of Salvelinus alpinus. And uh, we might think here as is expected and how some sort of have, have uh, pointed out in the past that this may belong to the Hadichar, which is expected in the region, uh, taking its name from the lake and for which no reference uh, genetic data is available to compare. So as Pete said, as a continuation of the natural capital lab, we might be looking into working with the, with fishermen or others that are able to get a sample to us and we can start looking at the genetic difference because this is something really important that um, you know in uh, in Scotland it's likely the Arctic char was sort of the first freshwater fish to colonize Scotland and it's a UK biodiversity action plan priority fish species and it has lots of potential threats there are known extinctions of uh, Arctic char from lakes in Scotland, and there are presumed to be up to 15 sort of subspecies possibly across different freshwater lakes. So there's sort of quite a, a massive sort of evolutionary diversion that probably happened after the last ice age. And it's something really interesting that we think ought to be considered when looking at sort of uh, at conservation action plans going forward. So I'm going to close it there because of time, but happy to answer anything else. Oh, that's our site, sorry. <laughs> I just Thank have one more much. slide after that, if that's okay. <clears throat> yeah, just a couple more. Benji said, no matter how comprehensive your baseline study, there's always further work to do. So we're always going to identify opportunities for further, further investigation, uh, whether it's the Hadi Char or Water Bowl. But one, one of the things we're looking at, obviously, in relation to this, the Natural Capital Laboratory, is missing species. So in terms of aquatic species, we'll be analysing the data to see if there are any significant notable species present that may otherwise be present in an unspoilt highland environment in Scotland. So uh, whether it's waterfall, aquatic invertebrate species, fish, uh, and that's the intention of, of the project, really, to enhance habitats, improve water quality, um and and overall enhanced biodiversity so yeah thanks tony hope we haven't gone over too much no thanks uh pete thanks benji that does lead us nicely into the next presentation but there's a couple of questions uh the first from vanessa mcmillan um is there anything to compare to elsewhere so have we got um can we compare the baseline that you have um established to other um sites maybe in the region or further afield? Uh, and if not, or even if yes, uh, how does the baseline, um, sorry, uh, is the baseline better or worse than you expected? Um, I, I think this is probably more of a comprehensive baseline than we would normally do. We wouldn't normally do this extent of study, for example, for an impact assessment or for a, for a baseline study. 
Um, it's, it's nice to be able to do the conventional sampling alongside eDNA. So we have got a much more comprehensive list of species. We're, we're getting data of species upstream, uh, potentially much further upstream in the catchment. eDNA can travel a long distance downstream depending on flow rate and a lot of other conditions and, and factors. So in terms of data to compare to, the probably the closest thing we've got is uh, WFD monitoring data. Um, so yeah, we, we, there will be opportunities to compare it to, to data from similar sites nearby, whether they've been monitored in such an upstream location, an upland location, probably not, because WFD monitoring locations tend to be at the downstream end of a catchment. So yeah, it's an interesting question, but I do think we, we've got a, an especially comprehensive baseline here. Okay, and again, that might lead on to the next question, which is from Rich Bull. Um, when carrying out EDNA &E, um, sampling in rivers, how far upstream are you detecting and how can you tell uh, where species are actually occurring? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take that quickly. I mean, it is a, a big question that has been partly answered based on hundreds of sort of academic studies that have looked at, for example, um, you know, having caged uh, fish or particular species at sites and looking at how the DNA is picked up sort of at 100 meter intervals. Uh, the consensus is that it can flow downstream uh, from sort of one or two kilometers up to 10, depending on the conditions of the site and the river. So eDNA tends to last longer in, for example, colder environments. It's sort of, it's better stored and will last longer. So in Scotland, for example, you might have that the DNA will remain longer in the environment, but something important to consider, and as, as you saw in this data, is that it's only the most abundant DNA that remains um, as it travels downstream. So the, more, the rarer the species and the number of sequences the faster it will deteriorate in the water, which is basically acts as, a, as an agent that destroys DNA within time, which is great for us because it means that your highly abundant species are actually picked up sort of throughout from, from upstream to downstream, but your rarer species in smaller DNA quantities, you will actually, where you, where you pick them up will probably be a lot more localized, especially if you have multiple sites and you pick up a rare species, say at site four, and not at site three, then you know that it's probably found at that, at that site. And that's something that I work a lot with a lot of our, of our, um, our clients in terms of understanding how to build that sampling strategy. And we learn from it from sort of experiments like this one with the ATOM team at the, at the Natural Capital Lab, where we've done a lot of learning and sort of, and bringing that into our thinking for future surveys. Great. That's a very interesting. One uh, follow-on question from Vanessa. Uh, do some species shed more DNA than others? Yeah, that's another interesting one. And I think uh, that links up again with the sort of with the scientific and sort of local knowledge of the species, of their of their behaviors, of their sort of ecological niches. Uh, for example, species that are highly active, like fish species that tend to fight or sort of, you know, move around a lot will shed more DNA than species like the Arctic char, for example, which probably remains at the bottom of the lake and for, for long times of the year is not highly active. So that's why we picked it up in very small quantities. So it is something to consider. The reproductive events can be picked up, for example, with long-term monitoring. We have a long-term monitoring sites, site on the Thames River, which I can share an example report from where we do a sampling event every month we actually see spikes of DNA that are matched to the reproductive um, season of specific species because obviously there's more DNA released in the environment. So you're able to track these things, for example, migrations of species coming up and downstream, which is really, really exciting and interesting. Yes, yeah, very interesting. Yeah. Just, just related to that, another thing to bear in mind is the size of the, the individuals of that species. So obviously a, a large brown trout will shed a lot more DNA than a, than a small stickleback or a minnow. So when we're looking at the relative abundance of DNA, it's, it's the relative abundance of DNA, not necessarily the relative abundance of species. So we have to, to bear that in mind as well. There are a lot of factors to, to take into account, which makes it quite complicated. 
Great. Thank you, Pete and Benji. Um, the last presentation is from Max Heaver. Uh, Max works for DEFRA and he's going to talk about uh, rewilding and species introductions. Thanks, Max. Thanks, Tony. Um, so I'll, I'll clarify first that I'm speaking today as a trustee of the Lifescape project um, and, and not sorry, DEFRA. No, no, uh, <laughs> I do work for DEFRA. Um, but, but yeah, uh, the, my involvement with the MCL is, is to do with my Lifescape side. Um, and I'm going to be talking a bit about rewilding and species reintroductions generally, uh, then moving on to, to how we've been trying to apply it as the Lifescape project, uh, including our early thinking and applying it to the NCL, the Natural Capital Laboratory. Uh, so uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over our justification for, for rewilding and move straight on to, to the sort of question of the definition and what it is. Um, it's a bigger question than I can do justice in a, in a 10 minute presentation. Um, but fortunately, the IUCN's uh, rewilding thematic group uh, has done the job pretty well for us um, and have come up with a, a working definition uh, designed to be internationally applicable. Um, and as I interpret it, it has three main components. Firstly, the process of rebuilding a natural ecosystem following major human disturbance uh, by restoring natural processes and the complete food web. Uh, secondly, the ultimate goal uh, being the restoration of functioning native ecosystems. Um, and third, that rewilded ecosystems should, where possible, be self-sustaining uh, and require minimum intervention and management, so letting nature do its thing, really. Uh, so given the short time uh, to, to talk about the justification for rewilding uh, and the enormous scope for misinterpretation of the term, I'm also going to quickly refer to a couple of Ian Convery's uh, six rewilding fallacies uh, that he's kindly passed on to me, um, just because I think they are really, really helpful clarifications. So firstly, uh, that it's not about rewilding everywhere. Um, a rewilding re approach doesn't mean that we, we don't need farmland, that we don't need food uh, or important commodities like timber. Um, and the second one uh, is that it is absolutely compatible with those wider activities, um, protected site management, uh, agri-environment schemes uh, that are also pursuing ecological restoration. It doesn't mean ditching those more traditional methods, it means complementing them. Uh, so next slide, please. I'm hoping that some of the emerging guidance in the space also helps to address the potential misinterpretations uh, around the term um, and consensus is growing around the right ways to do rewilding. Again, referring back to the IUCN's rewilding task force here, uh, they've published a set of guiding principles for, re for rewilding um, and absolutely recommend taking a look at the principles themselves. But I think they're really nicely distilled in this uh, article here, uh, which I'm plugging again and was plugged earlier in the comments by, by Ian himself, one of the authors. Um, and it talks about four tips uh, for rewilding um, that I think really get to the heart of of what it should be. Uh, so firstly, don't always start with wolves. Um, a fully restored ecosystem would have top predators, uh, but there are lots of other missing parts, including herbivores and invertebrates that occupy important trophic roles too. Uh, secondly, do reconnect people with nature too. Uh, rewilding involves reducing harmful human pressures, but it doesn't mean excluding people. Uh, rewilding should actually help people develop a more positive relationship with the natural world and should enable learning from nature too. Um, and I think that's one area where the NCL is off to a really great start. Um, thirdly, uh, don't alienate rural communities. Uh, the prospect of rewilding has understandably made a lot of people in the countryside anxious. Uh, we need to make sure that we're including local people at every stage of the rewilding project. Uh, we shouldn't be relying on formal consultation alone, and ideally rewilding projects should be driven by local people who could organise and set the agenda for how their land is managed. Uh, and lastly, of those four, do think about the future. Um, some people worry that rewilding means pining for the age of saber-toothed cats, uh, looking back can absolutely allow us to see what has been lost from a degraded site or landscape, but it doesn't mean rewinding the clock. It's about looking to the future, asking how we can manage our landscape more sustainably uh, and what species may or may not be a part of that. So we're getting a better idea of how rewilding should work um, and that sp species reintroductions aren't the whole story, um, but we can't escape the fact that they are an important and exciting part of it. Uh, so next slide, please. Um, an increasing number of landowners and managers uh, have carried their ambitions for more complete ecosystems and food webs through into action across the UK. We're seeing a huge number of reintroduction projects underway. Uh, we've seen the Scottish beaver trial and the host of subsequent beaver reintroduction projects, uh, wild abelian bison reintroductions, Isle of Wight sea eagles, uh, the Vincent Wildlife Trust's work on pine marten recovery, trees for livespread squirrel work. Um, and a whole host of other invertebrate reintroductions, uh, which I'm, I'm going to gloss over as a collective, um, other than mentioning a, a particularly interesting field cricket one uh, in 1992, which is worth having a look at. Um, so we're not the only ones thinking about it at the Lifescape Project, um, but I see our interest really stemming from two key drivers. 
uh, for reintroductions. The first is this sort of dry ecological reason. So as I discussed in sort of definition of rewilding, um, we need to complete food webs for it to work well, um, and for ecosystems to be sustainable with low levels of management. So for rewilding to work well at scale, reintroductions can be a really practical and necessary option. And the next is a little bit more moral uh, and emotionally driven. Um, many of you will have heard of the shifting baselines effect used to describe the tolerance of successive generations towards wildlife declines. Uh, we talk about how many fewer insects splatter our windscreens nowadays, but this effect is more extreme for extinctions, uh, which by definition move the decline out of our sight. So not many of us actually miss links uh, or find that our rivers look turbid and uninteresting without beavers in their tributaries, um, but maybe we would if we hadn't been around to see them go. Um, so we think describing that part of that vision can be quite powerful in making people realise what's been lost and to think a little bit creatively about what we could achieve. Um, and that second point leads us on to some recent work we've undertaken as LifeScape project uh, to explore that point. Uh, so the next slide, please. Uh, so Chris introduced the LifeScape project, which is a rewilding charity. Um, and this project was mainly undertaken between LifeScape, uh, the University of Cumbria, ACOM and Cumbria Wildlife Trust. Um, so we saw that some reintroduction projects start with an enthusiastic advocate of a particular species and that sometimes the surrounding community can be almost relegated to a kind of late stage consultee or even a hurdle to overcome. Um, and that seemed wrong to us and to kind of contradict the emerging guidance on rewilding. So we wanted to try and find the start of the process, uh, which seemed to be an open minded discussion of the opportunities in a given area. Um, ultimately, we wanted to highlight what had been lost in terms of species and ask a region what they could imagine being reintroduced in their area in the long term. So we hope that it would partly inspire local wildlife and community groups to develop their own reintroduction programmes. Secondly, build understanding in line with the IUCN's guidelines on reintroductions of the benefits and costs that might be associated with reintroducing some of these species for local communities. And lastly, provide a template for other organisations to apply to assess the suitability of species reintroductions in other areas. So we produced this uh, lost species report, which is shown on the slide, which showcases 10 species uh, from beavers to butterflies that we selected through our shortlisting process and our assessment of the sort of main benefits and risks. Um, following publication, LifeScape colleagues have been presenting the findings to a number of local fora and have had really positive feedback and even a few landowners inquiring about opportunities for their land already. Um, and whilst we shied away from picking any particular species and being prescriptive in any way, we did ask which of the 10 species piqued people's interest most in a survey of local wildlife trust members. Um, and I was surprised to see that it wasn't necessarily the biggest species, the lynx or the elk that drew most support, but instead the beaver, chuff, pine martin and white-tailed eagles. Um, so I took that as confirmation that local communities do have their own visions for rewilding um, and they're not always what you'd expect or predict. Um, so we've since had really positive feedback. Um, and as I mentioned, a few landowners inquiring about their land. Uh, and the intention really is to carry that work on for the north of England. Uh, and hopefully work with some local groups to develop actual proposals, um, but again, in their own pace, on their own terms. So hopefully that gives a bit of a sense of what our thinking and perspective is on, on these projects from, from LifeScape project uh, side. I'm just very briefly going to talk now about uh, our plans for carrying this approach over to the uh, Natural Capital Laboratory site. Uh, so I'll start by stating the obvious. There are two major differences in context between Northern England, the scope of our previous report, and the NCL site. Firstly, scale. The NCL is a significant land holding, but the scales are highly relative to the species in question. Uh, introducing most species considered in our Northern England report uh, would mean looking well beyond the site boundaries of the laboratory uh, and building support across the wider landscape. So we'll need to reflect this in any early missing species identification work uh, without limiting ourselves to only considering the least mobile of invertebrate taxa uh, or causing anxiety to uh, neighbouring landowners by failing to presume their agreement. Uh, the next of the two is vision and timescale. So the NCL is setting out a clear vision to restore natural habitats on the site, but the destination depends in part, at least on the plan for management or lack of it, which is still being developed. Um, most reintroduction projects find a suitable site or area with the species in mind and then go through the process of reintroducing them. The NCL is still being restored from plantation forestry. So we're going to be almost predicting where the site is going in terms of habitat succession, and then trying to plan some time ahead for the kind of species that that could accommodate. Um, so we're currently in the process of commissioning some ex ecological expertise to look at what species and habitats the site could support. Um, but even in this very early stage, we're getting some really interesting questions arising from it. Um, so firstly, pursuing rewilding and reintroductions can cause quite tricky questions uh, when you start with a commercial plantation site, or at least a partly commercial plantation site. Um, is felling consistent with rewilding, um, or should the existing forestry stands be left where possible for nature to do its work on them and for them to be outcompeted by broadleaf species in Scots pine over time? And indeed, would that happen? 
Um, so there's a, a bit of a theoretical question there of how you reconcile a purist process interpretation of rewilding um, with our desire to expedite help for declining wildlife and get the site into as good a condition as possible um, soon. And then as you heard from previous speakers, we've got some fantastic baseline information on species presence, um, but evidence of the current biodiversity value also presents something of a challenge in terms of defining the restoration vision. So for example, the question again of whether to fell conifer um, stands becomes more complicated when we factor in the fact that we don't want to compromise the conservation of species currently using the site, like red squirrel and pine martin. Um, and then lastly, something of a conundrum, um, as I mentioned when discussing timescales, the long-term ambition for the site and surrounding landscape would be a fully functioning ecosystem with every trophic level occupied, um, but the early steps of restoring a site so that we can consider reintroductions later um, means dealing with the consequences of having that partially unoccupied uh, ecosystem. Uh, so we're restoring a site in line with rewilding principles without that uh, cliche component of a large carnivore to manage deer populations, um, which is obviously renowned across the, across the UK for its challenges. Um, deer fencing does provide an interim solution whilst broadly woodland is established, but is that a long-term solution? And again, how, how uh, consistent is the exclusion of herbivores uh, with a wider rewilding approach um, that pursues complete food webs? So I've rushed through that, but I hope that has given you a, a bit of a sense of our thinking on rewilding um, and the first steps of the journey we're starting at the NCL. Um, many stages yet to come, so do keep an eye on the Lightscape Project website, and thank you for listening. Thanks, Max. And sorry, it's just to clarify, speaking with his Lightscape Project hat on there. Uh, sorry about that. Um, I'm not sure if anyone has questions for Max, but I'm conscious there was a couple that came in from Nick O'Brien. Um, the first was to Chris, actually. Um, what are the drone data um, at the NCL being collected for? Is it mainly visual and topographical use? Uh, can drones contribute to the data required for natural capital accounting? And if so, in what way? Um, yeah, good question. In the first year, we started basically using the drones to do some nice like video footage and get some like pretty pictures of the site. Um, then we started doing this sort of seasonal fly through and recording the image and overlaying it on each other so we could see uh, how the habitat and the vegetation followed. Um, the coverage is changing over the season. Um, and then we started exploring how we could use that to create the 3D model of the site and whether we could um have the 3d model essentially changing over time with the new drone footage that's coming in um so we're still sort of exploring what we can do with the drone footage what we're currently looking at is how basically how drone footage compares to remote sensing satellite imagery um, and what it adds in terms of value and preciseness compared to satellite data um, and i mean ultimately what we'd like to get to is sort of remote approaches to undertaking biodiversity net gain assessment, so looking at habitat extent and condition and doing that remotely based on this kind of data. Um, it, there's, there's a lot of like, things to work through and it, there's some interesting like good and bad things about drones compared to satellite data and uh, I think ultimately what we're going to head towards is having this sort of suite of options from sending in an ecologist to do a sort of full detailed assessment on the ground to sending someone to fly a drone over a large area and collect high resolution data and then doing an assessment from that, or just doing it from a desktop based on satellite imagery data um, without sending anyone out to the field. Uh, Nick had a follow on question that was actually for Michael, but um, Chris, you might be able to ask it. He asked why there was a requirement for multiple drone flights um, over the site rather than just um, a single image stuck together multiple images stuck together? Um, uh, <laughs> speaking for the drone specialist, I think it was to get a wide range of um, viewpoints across the site. Um, one of the things we have been looking at is this, uh, we've set up specific points across the site where we think there's going to be significant ecological change. Um, and those have been the location points for the virtual reality. Uh, so we have a, we took 360 degree cameras out there and captured these sort of viewpoints. You can then see them in the virtual reality system and kind of like visit that point in the site. Uh, and then we've been layering on alternative features so you can look at how they might change over time. Uh, and for the drone flyovers, we wanted to make sure that the flight paths covered each of these visualization points so we could tie in what we get from that into the um, virtual reality thing. Um, 
but why it's done in very separate runs instead of one long run that looped around and not entirely store, it's probably a, sort of the most cost efficient route, I would imagine. It's good fun flying a drone around. Uh, thanks, Chris. Um, Pete, I think you want to say something about rewilding just following on from Max's presentation. Oh yeah, thanks Tony. Um, yeah, great presentation, Max. I just, I'm glad you mentioned about water quality and turbidity because yeah, it's not all about those high profile species like beaver and wolves and, and what have you. But I think in, in the context of the NCL site, it's, um, it's a really realistic um, opportunity for rewilding to develop those natural terrestrial habitats, uh, riparian planting, get those native species in there that's inevitably going to have positive benefits for the aquatic habitats. And of course, that doesn't just affect the aquatic habitats right next to the site, it's extending downstream um, a, a long, long way if you can improve water quality on that, in that river. So it has much wider positive impacts. So any, any rewilding, of course, you don't just want to chop down trees straight away. Uh, that would be catastrophic in terms of runoff and water quality and sedimentation. It's a gradual process and that needs to be rationalised with other objectives and uh, other schemes in the area. So yeah, it's really interesting to establish the baseline and then look forward to, uh, to, to rewilding in the future. Thanks, Pete. Um, Caroline McParland has asked, I think, to, to you, Max, um, how can we integrate rewilding approaches with uh, uh, other desirable changes in land use, notably less intensive agriculture and more effective deer management? Yeah, that, that's a massive, massive question, isn't it? Um, and I'll, I'll weasel my way out of it, I think, by just going back to that point I made about it, it not being uh, prescriptive, that it has to be uh, all of the landscapes everywhere. Um, it, it's an approach that can describe uh, what you're doing at a, at a site level right up to the landscape level. Um, and of course, uh, there, there are trade-offs if you, if you bring in uh, less intensive agriculture. Obviously, there's, there's less land for everything else. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty sure... Uh, given how much uh, other organizations are struggling with this question i'm not going to be able to give it any uh, <laughs> decent response now um but yeah we just refer back to the fact that it's it's obviously part of part of all of those trade-offs that we're going to have to make um, between agriculture uh, nature and, and other uses i just add on to that um one of the things we're hoping uh to do with this idea of having like multi-capital accounting so looking at uh, natural, social, human, intellectual, financial, and manufactured capital um, in the account. What we'd hope to get is a sort of a rounded picture of rewilding, so understanding both the, the environmental impacts, but also impacts on social uh, issues, impacts on jobs and employment, education opportunities, and get a sort of a rounded picture. And I think any key to it's, it's key to any discussion about trade-offs in, in land use and how we manage the land is that we understand the full implications and don't just focus on the environmental side or the financial side, but have this bigger picture look. Um, and what we're hoping is that through looking at this, this wider lens, there will, be, there, will, there will be a clear sort of story about what rewilding projects can provide for landscapes and how they can provide benefits beyond just sort of carbon and um, uh, mayflies. Thanks, Chris. Um, Chris Bray has put a question to Pete or Benji. Um, you mentioned the results from eDNA in water samples, but how different are the results from bulk tissue analysis of invertebrates? So, pick this up, Benji. So, uh, yeah, good question. Very, very similar, actually, because we are we collected the invertebrate samples. They were analysed conventionally in the laboratory, and then we send the specimens to Benji and the team for analysis. There were a very small number of species that weren't picked up in the, the DNA analysis. One that springs to mind is a pill clam, a Pisidium species. That was only present at one site and it, it's likely that that was overshadowed by the larger, larger number of DNA from the other species. But generally, yeah, the results were very comparable, very similar. And some, I think Pete, if I remember uh, correctly, a few that were only identified to genus level, were identified to species level with the DNA work. Yeah, and vice versa, yeah. yeah. Very comparable. 
Thank you. Um, Ro, who is a member of the Highland Biodiversity Action Plan Working Group, has asked whether our records, species records from the NCL are being submitted uh, to MBN or, or similar. That's good. Um, and we would we would generally submit records on a, an annual basis to recording uh, groups. Obviously, the, the resolution at which we submit those records is going to be determined by where we know they are. If we've only picked them up by EDNA and we're not sure about the exact location, then it might be a broader grid square uh, or hectare or whatever. So it's, yeah, we, records would be submitted according to the resolution where we know they're, they're present. Yeah, Ro, Ro makes that point. And Chris, is that the same for terrestrial species as well? Yeah, um, I don't think we've done it yet, but there is a definitely an intention to do a, a data release of some kind um, and make sure that kind of like sharing um, the learning from this and making it accessible. One of the like, one of the principles is to encourage sort of learning and sharing and research into like developing tools approaches. So we're really like keen on uh, sharing the data. Like that. Great. Um, Emma Williams has asked um, what response uh, the NCL is getting from other, <clears throat> excuse me, local landowners and whether there are others that might be interested in a similar project covering a wider area, particularly thinking about species reintroductions. Yeah. Do you want to go, Max? No, no, I, I was going to refer it over to you, I think, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> you go ahead. We've definitely been speaking to, I mean, it, I'd say the first year was mostly getting our heads around what we we're doing and kind of you know, coming up with the vision for the project and the baselining work. We're now in, getting into that point of starting to talk more broadly about it and starting to engage with some other people in the area. Um, the, I mean, the obvious uh, group uh, that we've been speaking to up to is Trees for Life. We're not very far away from the side of the lock. Um, and there's also the Bunloit estate, which is um, on the shores of the lock as well. One of the things which I think we're particularly interested and excited about is the, uh, you might have seen Trees for Life's East West Wild project, which is trying to connect up areas of land um, and create a corridor from Loch Ness to the, well, essentially from Loch Ness to the coast. Um, and yeah, it, I think in the sort of longer term, the aspiration is to create this sort of bigger joined up network of sites. Um, and we're hoping when we do the next update, to have a, a digital platform which is bringing in the trees for life and dragon estate um, and um, so you'll be able to see how the landscape's kind of building up as you know not just this sort of very um, narrow site boundary um, and yeah a, a key component i think of any species work will be starting to speak more and more about other landowners and people in the area about how, how things are going to be managed beyond the site boundary Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Ro has managed to get Roger to kindly agree to allow CIM to host an event at the NCL, so we can all look forward to that at some point in the future. Um, thanks, Roger. Um, there was a follow-up question from Chris Spray. Um, what are the cost? Oh, it's gone. What are the cost and operational differences of eDNA water sample collecting uh, compared to bulk tissue sample analysis, or are they essentially the same? So I can take this one quickly. Um, so the operational aspect is obviously a bit different because one of them you're just going in, you're collecting a water sample, which will take approximately sort of five to 15 minutes, depending on where you are. And the other one will be, you'll have to go in with your kit and sort of collect the bulk invertebrate sample, clean it, store it in ethanol, and then send it back. So there's a bit of more logistics involved possibly, but the actual, Analysis costs ultimately are the same per sample, uh, sort of on our end. So as the, the sort of processing cost will be the same, um, except for uh, how many primaries you want to target. So obviously from water, you're able to look at different um, taxonomic groups. You can do this with macroinvertebrates to an extent. For example, you could say, for example, target uh, vertebrates from the midges or sort of other biting species, and you might be able to get actually data from the DNA of uh, mammals or other groups that might be of interest. So that there's a few different things to consider, but ultimately very similar sort of for us for processing and obviously different possibly for you for collecting the samples. Can I just add to that as well? So 
this this is effectively why we're doing the comparison so to see where each method can be can be applied in different circumstances so ultimately the, it depends what you're looking for if you're looking to identify all species that are present for conservation purposes then water sampling free dna is is perfect if you're doing much targeted water quality sampling say for for water quality in a specific location then you might want to con consider a conventional method or a combination with bulk DNA. So yeah, it depends what you're doing. They each have the merits. Okay, and maybe the last question, because we're about to run out of time is from Vanessa McMillan. What do the baseline surveys show about uh, the condition of terrestrial habitats? I can possibly answer that. <laughs> Chris says yes. Um, the site is a is a mixture of, uh, as you can see, some of the non-native conifer plantation areas of clear fell, and uh, more native broadleaved species, uh, tree species, particularly along the watercourse. Um, we are looking at uh, the potential for restoring an area of peatland, which lies immediately adjacent to the watercourse. So. Um, COVID sort of delayed our start to that, but we've um, recently been installing uh, water monitoring equipment and doing some peat probing and some habitat surveys to try and uh, establish our baseline um, with a view to restoring that area of peatland, which has been historically uh, drained um, for tree planting and is now being uh, colonized naturally by birch scrub so uh, we're looking at the potential to to take action to restore that which would be great um i think we'll probably have to wrap it up there um annie i don't know if you have anything to say but um could i just thank all the speakers and to everyone for attending it's great to have so many people here Yes, thank you, Tony. And uh, thanks to all, all the speakers. It's been a fascinating evening of talks and uh, we're delighted to get you back in two years time and have an update on the project and uh, see all the developments. And I love Ray's idea of a, a member network fieldwork outing. So I think Tony will be plotting that in a, in a year or so's time. Um, just a wee plug, we've got three training courses coming up in the next month or so, one on groundwater dependent terrestrial ecosystems and with Adrian Dave's Davis and two botanical ones with Ben Averis. And then our next Assigned Scotland member network event is on the 22nd of July on tree health in Scotland. It's literally gone on live today. And um, we'll be joined by Paddy Robertson from Scottish Forestry, who will look at the context of tree health in Scotland. Ruth Mitchell from JHI, who will talk about ash dieback and looking at case study examples on the impact of biodiversity and alternatives and Alan Gale, who's the Adaption Program Manager at F Forest and Land Scotland, who will talk about the impacts of Phytophora. So it will be great if we can see you on the 22nd of July. If anyone ever wants to do a talk or a field outing, when we can, we can do those again now, or uh, even just a networking discussion session, um, please do get in touch. Myself and the Scotland Committee are always keen to receive any ideas um, that the membership has. So thanks again to everyone for attending tonight and all the speakers and for Tony for organising this as well. So thank you everyone. <laughs>